Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Faithful listeners, and who among you is not, will remember a strange and wonderful story we presented some time ago about a member of the beat generation called the Tennis Shoe. It was the first radio play by a young man of whom we have expected much, and we have not been disappointed. Here with another strange and wonderful story by 26-year-old George Bamber. In years to come, we feel confident that we will be proud to recall that it was on suspense that this brilliant writer was first heard. Listen, listen then as Richard Beals stars in Return to Dust. And now, Return to Dust, starring Mr. Richard Beals, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Testing. One, two, three. Testing. Testing. Attention, Dr. Warren Bader, Department of Pathology, School of Medicine, State University. This is James Howard, Research Fellow in Pathology, speaking. At the moment, I am seated on the tape recorder that is recording this message to you. As a point of fact, by the yardstick on my desk, I stand exactly 12 inches and I am steadily decreasing in size. I calculate if I continue to shrink at the present rate of speed, it is possible that I will become invisible to the human eye sometime before midnight. I've been trying to reach you by phone since 8 this morning, but you are not at home and have not yet arrived at your office. Since you are the only person with an adequate scientific background and technical knowledge to save me, it is imperative that my last whereabouts is known to you in the event I cannot contact you by phone. Thus, the precaution of this recording. As you will have discovered by now, I have gone against your orders and pursued my theory of cancer cell growth by working in the lab at night after my regular duties. I have been trying to prove that the biochemical agent not only stops abnormal cell division, but reduces the existing cells in physical size until the neutralizer is induced. The fact that I have shrunk from five and one half feet to one foot should be proof beyond refutation, though my condition is the result of an accident. While trying to introduce a more powerful catalyst in the laboratory last night, I inadvertently created an uncontrolled reaction which manifested itself as a white mist which filled the entire lab. The mist lasted no more than a few seconds, and as I observed no effects other than this, I continued working. When I got home, I descended into one of the deepest and blackest sleeps I have ever experienced. I woke this morning to discover myself literally lost in a sea of blankets. I had shrunk four feet eight inches during the night. Naturally, my first reaction was one of panic. But I soon realized that my only salvation was to remain calm until I contacted you. You'll find a more complete report of my theory and the experiments which I've conducted to prove it and the uncompleted thesis here on my desk. This thesis, Dr. Bader, will open a door to a cure for man's worst disease, cancer. As for myself, you'll find detailed instructions on how to reverse the action, which I've accidentally initiated. You'll find this on pages 79, 80, and 81. No matter how small I shall become, even microscopic, you will be able to reverse the process if you follow the instructions on those pages. Now, I had better place another telephone call to your office, Dr. Bader, while I'm still big enough to dial the phone. It is just possible that your efficient secretary forgot to tell you that I called. The phone has grown almost half as tall as I am. A strange sensation. Who would think the... Tensor springs on these dials would be so strong. And who would think I would have to use both hands to dial the telephone? Pathology, Dr. 
Bader's office, Miss Pritchard speaking. Miss Pritchard, has Dr. Bader come in yet? Whom shall I say is calling? This is James Howard, Miss Pritchard. It's urgent. It doesn't sound like you, Mr. Howard. It, it's, it's me, all right. I'm sorry, Dr. Bader isn't in. Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. Dr. Bader is not at this moment in his office. Now look, Miss Pritchard, don't pull that. Dr. Bader isn't in stuff to me. You tell Dr. Bader I have to talk to him. I'm sorry, Mr. Howard. Dr. Bader is not in. Look, this is a matter of life and death. I'll tell him when he comes in. In the meantime, is there anything I can do? There's nothing anyone can do but Dr. Bader. He's the only man in the world that can help me. Well, I'll tell him as soon as he comes in. Yes, you do that, Miss Pritchard. Why, Dr. Bader? Why, of all days, did you have to pick today to change your routine? For the last 20 years, you've been in your office from 9 until 12. Why did you have to pick this morning to change? Preservation is the most powerful instinct. It is now 3.30 in the afternoon and I have shrunk to the unbelievable height of six inches. And I'm continuing to shrink. Yet I'm taking every precaution to guarantee that I stay alive. What have I got to live for? What am I? A 32-year-old old man that's losing his hair? Walks with a stoop from years of hunching over microscopes. What have I got to show for it? A cheap, furnished room. A meager position as a research fellow. Which doesn't pay enough to live like other people. Not enough to have a wife or children. And no dignity, certainly. All that I can call mine is in this room. A couple of suits... Some socks with holes in them, piles of heavy books, a microscope on my desk, and a tape recorder to record my notes on. That's all that will be left of Mr. James Howard, research fellow. Oh, excuse me, Dr. Pastor. And one green and gold parakeet with the name of Pastor. Two Pose a hypothetical problem, Dr. Pasteur. Who's going to change the water in your cage if I return to dust? Certainly not Dr. Bader. He might steal what little water you had, but he wouldn't change it. Who will? If I don't contact the doctor, it may be a week before the landlady comes up here to clean. He'd starve to death. I've got to open that cage and let him loose. But how? The yardstick. I can push the latch open with that. Yes. Yes, I can just reach it. There. You're free, Dr. Pasteur. You're free. The window is open across the room. There's a whole world... Fly away and make a name for yourself. The whole world. I've got the whole world ahead of me, too, if I live. After I publish my thesis, I'll be famous. I'll have everything I ever dreamed of. But not unless Dr. Bader gets the instructions. So, we resume taping. But I can't reach the start button on the recorder. These, these books, they're like a grand staircase to the cake deck. And now to start the machine. I'm no longer big enough to push it. Kick it. Oh, oh that hurt. I've got it. Jump on it. There we go. Dr. Bader? Dr. Bader. This is James Howard recording again. 
I have still not received your phone call, but I have not given up hope. In the meanwhile, I have made the necessary precautions for isolating myself in the event that you do not call before tomorrow morning. I have made a ramp with a ruler to the stage of the microscope. Glued to the microscope is a transparent glass petri dish. As soon as it becomes apparent that I'm in danger of being lost from view on the desk, I will make my way to the petri dish. But what if you haven't called by the time I could be lost in the petri dish? I could prepare a slide for myself. If I diminish to the size of a one-celled organism, I would have no difficulty in crawling under the cover glass and taking up a position directly under the lens. Perhaps I should prepare a slide now. You've called, Dr. Bader! You've called at last! No! I, I, I can't lift it! I'm too small! I can't lift it off the cradle! Don't stop ringing, please! I'll lift it somehow! But how? A, a, a lever! Give me a lever and I can move the world! Homo sapiens. 
Condition? Excellent. Oh, Dr. Pastor. Haven't you flown the coop yet? Is your loyalty so great that you refuse to leave so long as the last particle of me remains? Or are you hungry? What an ugly monster you are from this perspective. Your feathers are like scales of armor. Infested with lice, I see. And that beak. No! No, Dr. Pastor! No! Get away! I must back up slowly. Don't run. Slow. Back between the books and the microphone. Slowly. No. I'm safe here. Until he loses interest. I should have let him starve to death in his cage. I wonder if the tape's still recording. I can see the spools still turning. High above me, the, the clear plastic reflecting the last rays of the sun setting outside my window. But I can't see if there's tape. Are you there? Are you my recording, Dr. Bader? This is James Howard. As soon as the bird loses interest, I'm going to make a break for it. I'll make the microscope, Dr. Bader. Don't you worry. Treat that slide, Mark James Howard, just like it was me. You understand? Even if you don't think I'm in it, if you can't bring me back, publish my thesis for me. You hear me, Dr. Bader? Publish my thesis. I can't die smaller than dust unknown. I have nothing left, Dr. Bader. Not even my body. Give me my thesis. You wouldn't dare publish it in your name, Dr. Bader, would you? All you'd have to do is change the name on the title page. You wouldn't stoop that low, would you? No. No, give me my thesis, Dr. Bader. Give me that much. You hear me? Richard Beale starred in William N. Robeson's production of Return to Dust, written by George Bamber. Supporting Richard Beale's in Return to Dust were Paula Winslow and Lawrence Dobkin. Sound patterns by Bill James and Tom Hanley. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Victor Jory in Death Notice. Another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Stay tuned for News Analysis, which follows immediately on CBS Radio.